Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Conscious Pivot Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Markell, and I just want to acknowledge how blessed I feel in this moment just to be able to say that, to be able to say that I'm, I'm your host. I'm, 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 I'm not taking that for granted in this moment. I know we take a lot of things. I tend to take a lot of things for granted. And more and more, I'm finding myself just wanting to stay in, in a place, in a, in a true place of, of gratitude. Um, I've even started when people ask me, how am I doing these days? I say, I'm good and grateful because <laughs> I, I feel good. You know, I want to feel good. Um, but more than how I'm feeling in the moment, because I don't know if you're anything like me, uh, you know, my moods, they change kind of like the weather. You know, sometimes it's clouds, sometimes it's sun, sometimes it's rain or something else. Um, and my moods are, 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 uh, shifting. They don't shift every 10 seconds. Um, certainly, I don't, I don't think they do. But, but what is constant and what is always producing uh, my, my, my best self, my best outlook, the sunny outlook is, is when I feel grateful. So I am good and grateful to be here. And I feel excited and, and really lucky as well to have a colleague uh, on the show today, somebody that I get to interview, but we're just going to have a conversation. And he's somebody that I absolutely look to as, as a representative of what's best in, in the industry that I've been in for the better part of 12 years. He's been doing this a little bit longer than me. And, uh, and I think he's somebody that has just done, done this remarkable job of modeling what thought leadership really is about. Um, it's not just a term, but a way of living. And I think this man models that. He is the author of 24 books, which I've written a couple of books. and I'm in the process of a couple more. And just the idea of having 24 books under one's belt uh, is, is pretty amazing. And, and actually, I, I did post in a couple of places just about a month ago about his new book, Inside Your Customer's Imagination, Five Secrets to Creating Breakthrough Products, Services, and Solutions. Um, he's also bestseller, a bestselling author of Kaleidoscope, delivering innovative service that sparkles. And and I just I was so uh, blown away really by the creativity of of the project of his book, the latest book. And um, and I thought there's a lot to learn there. And most importantly, I think he's modeling exactly what he teaches at places uh, all around the globe now virtually. Um, Chip Bell is my guest today. I'm going to bring Chip on in just a second. He served as a keynote speaker, consultant, trainer on innovative service, innovative service. Again, not just a term, but a way of, of, of operating uh, to the kind of major organizations that probably all of you have heard of. GE, <laughs> Microsoft, that little company. Nationwide, Marriott, Lockheed Martin, Cadillac, Key Bank. Ritz Carlton Hotels, Caterpillar, Eli Lilly. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and he teaches them, he speaks to them, he enlightens uh, leaders on topics such as customer loyalty and partnering with customers, creating innovative ser service experiences, and the list goes on. Uh, he was also, if that wasn't enough, a highly decorated infantry unit commander in Vietnam, the elite 82nd Airborne, served as guerrilla tactics instructor at the U.S. Army Infantry School. His training programs have won awards, including the Stevie Award in 2018. So without further ado, I just want to say thank you, Chip, for making time out of your day to be with us now, and thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Adam. I'm grateful to be with you. Uh, to be a guest on your show. I've been looking forward to this, um, looking forward to having a good time and hopefully making a difference in the lives and the work of your listeners. So one thing I want folks to know just at the outset is that uh, Chip and I weren't introduced by anybody else. We, we kind of maybe running in some overlapping circles or parallel paths, if you will, but, uh, but Chip was kind enough out of the clear blue one day maybe six months ago or so. It was after the, the uh, pandemic had begun and, and in the public speaking world, things changed pretty radically overnight. You know, gigs that were booked, events that were scheduled were put on hold, some were canceled. You know, a lot of things were just really up in the air. And all of a sudden I get this introduction, this email where Chip Bell is introducing me to a, uh, a very uh, good client, a, a company that 
regularly puts on events and hires speakers and and chip made this introduction he said i think this is your guy and uh, you guys ought to talk and chip and i had never spoken before and so i just thought there's a word that you don't hear very often anymore it's kind of a, a word that maybe is gonna gonna make a resurgence at some point but it's the word is magnanimous and i think and i think about chip and that act what he did was just it was wonderful i mean look he was obviously wanting to be of service to to his to his client um but he did something really magnanimous that i appreciated chip so i you know if i don't mind if you don't mind i'd love to just to ask you about that right now is that is that a sort of the way that you operate typically or is i'm on this world for two reasons adam um to have fun and make a difference uh to make a contribution and i i have had many um who've been before me that have done that for me and so i, I it's always an opportunity to give back so yes it's an integral part of um my company and and what what I, what it represents you know i always say um to deal with your clients and colleagues in a way that would make your mother proud hmm. that good. where i come from it's your mama proud <laughs> make your mama proud well, i still my my i'm really lucky that my mama is still alive and i and i call her my mama so it's funny and i never That's did great. that for i don't know 50 years or something i would call her mom but of the last, I don't know, bunch of years, I just, uh, I call her mama and she, I think she really That's likes great. it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So Chip, you know, I, I read a lot from your bio, just about all the amazing things you've been up to in the world. What's one thing that's not a part of that beautiful bio that you would love for people to know about you? I, uh, I once opened for the Backstreet Boys. Um, <laughs> not too many people get to do that. The operative word, Adam, is once, <laughs> and it's a great story that, uh, you, you know, I, I sometimes tell at parties, but it is a true story. I did open for them. Um, I, I enjoy music and uh, enjoy writing music and performing music and have studied music, and um, so um, it was a, a situation in which uh, they, the, they were performing in a concert. I knew the organizer, producer, um they were running late they needed somebody to entertain the crowd <laughs> and um so they rolled out a grand piano and i got to do my billy joel routine and and uh, get the audience to sing until they could arrive and and set everything up so and that it gave me a chance to meet them at the time this was at the peak of their career so holy smokes yeah so i'm serious it did so um anyway i'm proud i'm proud of that yeah that's that's one of those things that uh Man, that just must have. Uh... <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, how did you get into public speaking? How, look, give me the, if you don't mind, let's get the origin story because sure, you come sure. out of the army and you're a decorated yeah. veteran. You know, how does it turn into this? Well, um, I've always been somebody got sent to the principal's office for talking too much. <laughs> well, now I know uh, why you and I have got connected. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. And so, uh, but, you know, I've always enjoyed being in front of a group um, and was president of the student body when I was in high school. And, you know, I was, as you read in the bio, I was a, ta a guerrilla tactics instructor in the military. And so teaching and training and, and presenting have always been a, a part of my professional expression. And um, so it's, you know, I've been doing it for a long time i'm still learning a lot about it and it's been interesting to watch how it's changed that whole world of keynotes and public speaking has changed um over the years and and it's you know it's hard to the challenge is to kind of create continually new content um so you're not a one-trick pony and you can continue to, to have something that's of interest to people that they want to hear you year after year after year um, you can't give the same old speech, you know, over and over and over. You've got to continually, and that's exciting to me because I love to learn. And so, uh, that's, that's, um, it's a part of who I am, I guess. Yeah. It, being relevant is, 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 it's pretty important in a world that is yeah. so rapidly being altered by technology and right. so many things predictable and, and obviously many that are, are, uh, are disruptive in a way that's not so predictable, but what was it like for you getting started in this industry and, and what, you know, give us a sense of 
sort of how that journey, as you say, lots of things have changed. Could you pinpoint some major catalytic moments? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was misquoted in saying, uh, you know, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. Uh, that's not true. Uh, they won't do that unless they know about your mousetrap. Uh, and so, you know, part of when people get in and speaking, and I, I've coached a lot of new people who are getting into that, um, they forget, they think, man, I'm a great speaker. You know, I, I really got a great message. Well, that's terrific, but unless people know about you. So in many ways, the most important part is building the kind of brand, um, the publicity, and most important, the networking, so that if you do have a great mousetrap, people will want to come to your door, so to speak. And um, so I, I think that's the hard part. You just, it's like a, a great chef who says, let's open a restaurant, not remembering that, you know, people got to know about it to find mm -hmm. your restaurant or want to find your restaurant. So it's the same thing. I think, you know, it's a critical part is, is that never ending marketing, never ending promoting and never ending network. Cause it's a, it's a, uh, it's a small community. There's a lot of competition, but it's a small community in a, in a sense that um, you want people to be connected. I mean, like you and I over my client who was saying, who's the greatest mind in the world on resilience. And I go, mm, okay, I think I know who that might be. And so, you know, it's, it's having the connection and having the network and, you know, so there are a lot of components to that. It's like selling a book, you know, uh, if you sold a book to your village, it wouldn't be enough. You know, you got to borrow other people's villages. And so I think that's, that, that's a kid, the most important part about having a, there's a lot of great keynote speakers out there, but they don't get to get on the stage. Now it's all virtual, of course, but uh, unless, uh, unless they're known um, and got a reputation. For sure. March comes along and uh, no surprise, the events that we had scheduled for the latter part of the year, or you know, even just a few months later were, were put on hold or canceled. So yes. moving, moving to virtual, what was that like for you? What, what's been some of your big learnings there? And, and where do you see that maybe there's some best practices that have evolved that other keynote speakers or other people that, that want to have an impact in the world and have a bunch of fun doing it, like you said earlier, where, where these best practices might actually help them at this point. Because I, I still hear from a lot of speakers. We have a lot of people in our community sure. who, are in the same sure. place who are struggling. You're right. Well, I think, um, I think there's several reasons why they might be struggling. Um, part of it is there was a decision made by particularly new speakers that they would give it away. Uh, I'll do my virtual keynote for free. That way the bureaus or meeting planners will hear about me. And when I, when it's back live again, they'll invite me to come back and speech. Well, uh, obviously what that did was de deteriorated the value of a, of a virtual keynote. Um, so that's one impact. Um, but, um, you know, organizations are still having virtual meetings, still bringing people together. It's not the networking, um, opportunity that it once was when it was live. Uh, it's not the exciting kind of opportunity where you, there's an energy in the room when you've got a speaker on the stage and you know, you're know you trying your best to be passionate and electrify the audience. It's not the same feel. Um, I miss the stage big, you know, obviously, but that's, we don't have the stage now. And I understand that. Um, but I think through it all, whether it's live or virtual, the thing that most, I think the most important component of being a great speaker is the degree to which you're totally uh, authentic and genuine when you're with your audience. Um, you know, having an audience, whether it's um, virtual or, or live, that feels like you're sort of a neighbor and, and your keynote is not just a oratory, you know, perfect, practice to hunt you've done it a hundred times and this you got every nuance down and every movement down like a, an actor might but rather it feels like a conversation it feels like an interaction even though you may have done it a hundred times the degree to which you come from who you are not what you remember and deliver a kind of that kind of transparent authentic genuine uh, presentation that's delivered with great confidence 
and as you say, delivered with great relevance. Um, but I think the authenticity is, is a critical part. It's much harder to do that, I think, through the camera. It's much easier when you've got real people and you can see their faces and see the impact you're having on them by the nonverbals. Uh, but nevertheless, I, you know, I, when usually when I'm doing uh, even a virtual keynote speech, um, I'm not in the room alone. I, I'm, I have people in the room. I have usually my wife's here, sometimes friends that, that are in the room just so I can feel that human connection right. um, with that audience. You know, Chip, that's a really interesting um, best practice, I'd say, for, for some folks that are struggling with the having to break through that imaginary fourth wall, right. speak into the camera as though there's somebody there with you, that, that that's an option is to have people live sure. there in the room. I mean, we're seeing it in other places, too, obviously, you know, the late night uh, folks like Seth Meyers or, or Jimmy right. Kimmel, you know, they've got scant audience or they've got their camera crews and other, you know, producers and people that are around who are, you know, they're not just providing the support of, of uh, you know, kind of holding space for them, but there is this exchange of energy. I think for those of us who've been doing this a length of time, you know that there's something you don't hear often, but with speakers, you're really managing energy. Like you yes, said, you are. You know, content yeah. content's important, but the context is really, I think, the king, the queen, yeah. and and that context is is how you're 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 as you say, engaging with an audience conversationally, where they can feel you, and right. and where there's a sense that that you know this is uh, this is unique and special, not just sort of memorex, you know, like exactly the old exactly world. Charlie Daniels, the late Charlie Daniels, who we lost not too long ago. Um, I wrote a book called Never Sing to the Empty Seats. And it, it, to me, it's a powerful line, uh, but it, it uh, both for the speaker and the audience. And that is, you, you don't worry about who's not there. You, you focus on making it as great as it can for those who are there. And even if that's one or two people in your studio, um, it, it's still, that's what you want to connect with and, and not think about the empty seats or people who are not there you know, so yeah. I've, I've remembered that um, that line, which was the title of one of his books. It's always helped me say, why am I here and who for whom am I here? Um, it's those that you're connecting with. Absolutely. So that's a that's a serious takeaway that you can have people in in the room. Part of our business, in addition to the keynote speaking aspect, is we train speakers. So we train people to do. TEDx events, TEDx talks, as well as other other high stakes uh, speaking engagements, and certainly those those events were done live, as you'd expect. And we could coach people live, we could film them, we could you know give them feedback, and all that kind of stuff was really intimate. We weren't sure whether we'd be able to do it virtually. And the first time we did the entire program, we did it in April, uh, virtually, and then just now completing actually tomorrow night. Uh, the second round of that, we started in September and I've been shocked at how well people have been able to do it through the, through this sort of artificial, sure. you know, right. <laughs> you know, exactly. camera. Exactly. Um, and, and I think it's one of those things that just practice. I mean, if I'm going to sort of show, look at a lot of, a lot of what we've, we found and have, you know, now think is, or would be best practices is that you just practice it enough. Yeah. You know, and I don't mean practice to become rote, memorized, robotic, but practice right. so that you feel comfortable, so that you could, in fact, sure. like, like you and I, right? We've never even yeah. met before. And yet we're having a conversation. We could very well be in the same room. Of course. It wouldn't be any different, right? I mean, right. but that's not something you just, I don't think you necessarily do that uh, by default. No. It's something no. you have to get comfortable with. And, and, I and that takes practice. And You're absolutely practice. right. Yep. So, so do you see that there's been any kind of shift in the, and I had this conversation interesting enough with, uh, with, um, with Nick Morgan, um, yep. little just one question kind of conversation around what's the status of, of our industry. And do you see that, that the buyers, the, the companies and the bureau or the, or the planners are now appreciating the value of 
the kind of professionalism that a experienced keynote speaker delivers in a virtual setting versus you know wanting to get it for for cheap or get it for free or something like that do you see i think i'm seeing that i i I'm, i mean i'm looking at what i'm you know the keynotes i'm booking out in the future 2022 and um they're clearly recognizing with there will be a life after a vaccine and uh, they're recognizing that the context of a live event with a great speaker is important. I've talked to some of them that um, have booked, um, as I do some of my homework about what you expect, and uh, as we all do as part of our preparation. Um, and, and, and they're recognizing that the keynote speaker is not just a deliverer of content, but they're a catalyst for energy and, and connection with, with um, people because bringing people together in a big convention room or a ballroom at a hotel it is more than anything a chance for a people to connect with each other around a particular topic yeah. um otherwise you could do them all virtually why would you spend the money on a hotel or a con convention center to bring people in except for that connection that opportunity to network and get to know each other and and all the things that come with a major gathering like that and they more and more are viewing the keynote speaker uh, again as a catalyst to that connection. So uh, how it changes for me is that um, using much more as we go into the future, much more things that will engage the audience with each other, not just as people who sit in the audience and listen. Um, I think there, there's going to be that much more that requirement going forward than we've seen in the past where they're just quietly sit and applaud and that kind of thing, but they don't connect to each other. There are speakers who do that. I uh, ask the audience questions, raise your hand if, that kind of thing. Um, it's quick, small group activities, turn to the person beside you and do this. Um, but I think that kind of uh, connection is gonna be much more a requirement um, and not just a talking head. Exactly, yeah, creating an, ex what we've, we've um come to know as accelerated learning the, yep. those, the where it's much more interactive and and now when it comes to the the virtual uh, speaking what we're finding is that and i don't know chip if you found the same thing is it going on for more than about five minutes i mean you have a great story you know any of us have got our right. stories and things but my stories now tend to be two to three minutes long and then yeah. I, and then i'm asking a question or putting them into a process like you said and uh, so that they're engaging with each other or engaging with the with the larger group because people just have you know I think it's called zoom fatigue <laughs> you know it is like it is yeah their attention span is a lot shorter than it used to be you know much shorter and um, here again there's I mean, part of the reason is that it's not inter interjected with sort of what I call water cooler conversations um, because I'm on a zoom call and I'm ready to get it off I mean I'm ready to finish it the, the efficiency becomes uh, much more important and a priority in how we do it. So therefore they've trained their psyche to be much more, um, you know, short attention, attention span. If you've got a story, it needs to be quick, get to the point, cut to the chase. Um, and, and, and most important, give me stuff to take away that I can do something with, I can use. And um, so here again, it's gonna, I think it will change the way in which um, keynotes are delivered going forward. How does this dovetail, Chip, with the work that you that you teach? Because you, you you teach on innovation and on I customer do. experience, and and so everybody's going through this now. That's one of the most interesting parts about this is this is a this is sort of a a global change. Rarely right. in our lives do we ever see one thing that's a catalyst for across the globe change to the way we conduct business and how we interact with people. Right. And I, and I think what, what it does for me, and here's the parallel between service as it's delivered at its best and a keynote. Um, people don't talk or tweet about good service anymore. It's gotta be unique. It's gotta be something over the top and different. Um, and what we used to say, what I want is a, I want a retained customer. I want a customer I keep. Well, uh, I, I think there's a le level higher than that. Loyalty goes higher than that. 
Then we got in on the bandwagon that says, I want people who will, who will recommend. We got net promoter. Would you recommend me to a family member or friend? There's a level higher than that. And, and that level higher than that, and this is where it dovetails with the keynote, is when you have a customer say to another, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And they tell a quick story. And the storytelling to me is the highest form of loyalty. It is an expression of advocacy rather than, yes, I would recommend them to, let me tell you a story about. That turns the customer, we've done research around this to say, you know, what causes that to happen? What causes somebody to want to tell a story? Well, they tell a story about service that's innovative and different and unique and ingenious, not just good not just effective. And so therefore, the more we are the creator of stories in the minds and lives of our customer, the larger their advocacy and, and uh, again, the pinnacle of their loyalty. The same with a keynote speaker. You know, if I can just stand up there with a PowerPoint and go through facts and figures, I'm not, my, my audience is not gonna be moved or, or remember it. But if I can make my audience feel special, valued, and important because of a story, a short story that I tell them, you know, their lives are going to be influenced and they will tell people that was a great speech. We think back over the greatest teachers that we all can name over history and they all use stories. They all use parables. They all use coins. They used whatever we called them, but it was a, a, a story metaphor kind of approach and I think it's the same with great speaking and great service. It almost sounds like <laughs> people that are not speakers, the, the, the work of being able to craft a story, deliver a, an impactful, effective story is, right. is something that helps them in, in a variety of ways outside of just like if you were ever going to present to anybody. Sure. Yeah. It's a mark of a great leader. You know, you think about the greatest leakers. We just lost one over the weekend, Tony Shea. Yes. Um, they were storytellers. You know, Herb Kelleher was a storyteller. Right. You know, we can go down the list. Um, and they tended to, to speak in stories. And, and again, it's, um, I think it is a leadership art. It's certainly a keynote speaking art. Um, but it's the, way, it's the way we now influence people because their lives are so filled with short facts, figures, that kind of thing that's just um, goes in one ear and out the other. Um, so taking the time to say, let me tell you a quick story that will illustrate this point. I think that's, to me, there. that's that's where it's going to go. We're going to see more of that. I read an article. I can't, I can't think of the name of it at this moment. Uh, I could actually send you this link, uh, Chip, and maybe we'll put this, we'll put this for sure in the show. Right. In, including links to where you can buy Chip's latest book, which I recommend, or any of the other 23 books <laughs> that Chip has, has <laughs> More than I've read. I've written more than I've read. <laughs> yeah, we'll put those in there as well. Um, <laughs> I read this article about how companies like KPMG and, and Microsoft and, and, and Google, they actually bring in consultants to help their folks, their leaders, learn how to speak their yes. personal narrative as well as the company narrative more, yes. more effectively with absolutely impact. I've taught some of those classes. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. Chip, I want to talk about resilience for a moment, as sure. you might imagine. I want to get your, your, your beat on it, your definition, if you will, and where it is that you've even seen in, in whether it's recent or, or, or not so recent time, you had to develop your resilience. What did that look like? Well, I start there. The you know, there's no place that has uh, requires resilience more than in combat. <laughs> I had the good fortune or misfortune to spend a lot of time in combat, and um, uh, that's that's particularly when you're a commander and you're in charge of a number of troops. Um, not only do you have to be tough and resilient and um, and keep going long after your body's screaming at you to stop, but you have to be the role model for that when you're in a, um, and, and to keep your cool. But I guess one particular incident that will be embedded in my memory as long as I live was, um, I was with the 82nd Airborne, as you mentioned in Vietnam, and um, we, uh, we were getting overrun one night on ambush. Um, and we were outnumbered about 
10 to one. Um, and so I realized that uh, in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, if they kept sweeping the area, they were gonna come walk right over us and we wouldn't live. And so I literally called in artillery um, from behind the, and walked it up to where our site was. And, it's, and they kept moving and I kept dropping the artillery rounds to the point where we're getting shrapnel all around us. And then the last one I called was literally on our location where the uh, artillery battalion had us located. And you can hear it coming. You're fired usually two or three miles away, but you can hear that round coming. And you've just whispered to all your troops, here it comes. It's going to be, say your prayers, because we're going to take them, they take these folks out with us, but this is the only way we're going, we're going to go, so we might as well take them with us. And, um, of course, it's the worst sound you can imagine. Your, your ears are, you can't hear for two or three days after that, because it's right on top of you. But a miracle happened. We took the enemy out, but I didn't have any troop, one single soldier, get hurt. Wow. And... We walked out the next morning, um, but being able to walk that, know that they're approaching us, walking that artillery behind them, and how it sounds is drop two five, drop two five, drop two five meters, and they just keep firing one round after us as it comes toward you with them in the middle. Um, that takes a lot of courage to just know that the next one's going to be your goodbye, but you've got to do that because you've got troops who are dependent on you, and so. You know, I, I learned like after that, that I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a person. I should have, I should have died in that moment. Um, but let me tell you, when I walk in a CEO's office, I'm not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think to myself, this is nothing. That's a different I've been, context. I've been nervous. This ain't nervous. <laughs> yeah, right. So. And, anyway. and you're, you know, moving beyond an event like that, or not just that event, but but the the duration of a of a conflict like that. How did you develop the the ability to? I mean, I think part of your definition of resilience hinges on what fear really looks like. Yeah, because you had you had you were able to to be courageous in the fa in at the face uh, or or in a moment where you were facing almost certain death right so yeah like you said getting on stage or walking into a ceo's office not the same fear no, no, not even close not even close and i think it it uh, you know i, I think and the for same that matter you know wearing I'm, I'm, I'm not making a political statement here but no. wearing a mask or or yeah doing your work on Zoom or any of the things that, that are causing a lot of yeah. angst for people, like compared yeah. to the context you just described, not so, not, not, not all that. The Zoom, yeah, the Zoom, and I don't mind making a political statement, the, the one that the, the people who don't want to face, wear a face mask cause of personal freedom is the one that I just flat don't get. So have them, have them that, you know, I want to, I say to those people sometimes who are saying, well, it's my personal right not to wear a face mask. Nobody can make me wear a mask, but I go, okay, walk in your kid's uh, grade school class and light up a cigarette and see how long you get to stand there and smoke. Yes. You know, let, let, you know, and why do we do that? Why, why did, why do we say no smoking in a public area? Because people don't want to get exposed to a secondary smoke. Well, why do we want to have people wear masks? Because people don't want to get COVID from somebody who may have it. Hey, Chip. It seems to me the principle <laughs> is identical. I, I, it's funny, you and I, very simpatico. So I, yeah. didn't, I don't, the cigarette example is a really good one. The one I've been thinking. Well, it's identical. It's identical. Well, I just thought to myself, how about the seatbelt? I mean, I'm old enough yeah. to, you didn't have to wear a seatbelt. No, no, no. And if the right. highway patrol stops you and you're not wearing a seatbelt and you say, look, it's my personal freedom not to wear one, you're still going to get a ticket. <laughs> you get a ticket. Exactly. Uh, no, well, that's fine. It is your personal right. freedom. And here's a little something for you. you know? All right. Absolutely. <laughs> So yeah. I just, right. that's a silly concept to me. I believe in freedom, but we learned a long time ago, you just cause you got freedom doesn't mean you can cry fire in a crowded theater. You know, but there's a limit. So. Indeed, sir. I, I couldn't agree <laughs> with you more. And I, I, 
really want to take this opportunity. I don't know that you ever can hear this enough times, but thank you. Thank you for your service. Oh, my pleasure. Well, there were a lot of people there who supported me, you know, that, that uh, I, I'm always grateful for. So. Yeah, it, it's a team. I mean, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an effort of so many people who are committed to the same, to the yeah. same, you know, important yeah. ideals. Doesn't mean you do it perfectly. Doesn't no. mean anything's ever done perfectly. No. But we learn from all these experiences. That's right. That's right. And, and that's really what I think matters so so you greatly. Get it. So Chip, as we wind things down, I want to ask you just about your own your own personal rituals for your resilience, because I'm not disclosing uh uh you know how how long you've been doing this, but you've been doing this a while. It takes a while 40, to write 20, forty years. Twenty four. Well, I started my company forty years ago. Forty years ago, and you've written yeah. twenty four books, and yeah. you're out there on the trail. Although our trail is virtual. At the yeah, moment. yeah. All right. But I'm still. Yeah. But I we'll can't wait back. to get on. I still can't wait to get back on that airplane and go to a stage. And you already and you got gigs lined up in 2022. Yeah, 2022. Yeah. So what I'm I'm imagining is that in addition to maybe some good constitution, <laughs> some you know some good genes and all that. Well, we were talking about our mama. My mama lived to be 102. All right. So there you go. You got some. There's genes that are working. I on hope it. I'm counting on it. But What's I want to know what you could doing. be walking across the street and get beer truck tomorrow. You know. <laughs> Oh, you're killing me now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what you're laying there going, dang, I could have had buttered popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> People are laughing right now. They know where I'm going with this. Like, I want to know what you do to take care of yourself. Oh, oh, great. Yeah. Well, I'm an early riser. I get up at, I get up every morning at six o'clock, whether I need to or not. I'm at work by seven because I love my work. Um, I have uh, um, uh, uh, exercise. I walk every day. Um, I eat right. I uh, drank good whiskey. Um, so Gotta yeah, I've ha been happily married for over 50 years. So I think all of that kind of, and I have a deep faith in, a, in the almighty. Yeah. Um, all of those things, I think I get plenty of sleep. Um, I don't have any trouble sleeping. So I think all of that from a physical standpoint helps, um, you know, so I, I'm a, I'm, I feel a very fortunate, blessed person. Yeah. I think you just outlined not just the physical, because I, I think a lot of people do believe that even when they hear a story like the one that you shared, that resilience is is that physical ability to just continue to move forward. Like no matter what's going on, you know, bombs could be dropping around you, but you still keep moving forward. And and what we find, and the research is pretty clear on this, is that it's not just physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's even sure. spiritual. Right. And what you just outlined in what you said, the rituals that you keep, very much, I think we're mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. And spiritual. Yeah. All of which are important. Yeah. All of which. I've, are. Got, a, I've got a cartoon that hangs on my wall. That's a, you know, the picture, it's a blue heron on the edge of the, of the water. And he's got a frog in his throat. And uh, he's this bullfrog in his throat. And the frog has his front uh, legs wrapped around the blue heron's neck. And the caption is never, ever give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, go Google it. Google it sometime. <laughs> Google blue hair, uh, heron and frog. Uh, never give up or, or any of that. And you'll see the cartoon. Yeah. Never, ever give up. You know, well, it's a clever cartoon. In so. post-production, I'm sure this is going to make it into the episode. So it's perfect. <laughs> it, it, That's it's great. Just W wonderful to have you as a guest I i'm as i'm closing it out I'll, I'll remind myself and remind those that that are um in need of reminders like me that yeah me too that the way for me I, I go back to my my not to my mama but to my grandmother who would say leave leave the house on the right foot start the day on the right, right. foot right. and and i thought later in my in my life about what that actually means i mean i I've, I've done everything from had you know the way ball players don't step on the lines you know as they walk across you know right. like a manager right. doesn't step on the on the uh, on the foul line i uh i i tend to before i'm gonna leave for a speaking engagement or any of those things i always consciously leave the house with my right foot that's right but i started okay. deep in that practice some years ago and thought well what's you know, what is it really, what's the first opportunity to do that? And I right. thought, well, it's just waking. You know, the moment I wake up, that's 
the opportunity to to start on the right foot. Right. And and so my own personal ritual, which was the subject of a TED talk I gave a couple of years ago, was about four simple words to start the day. It's right. it's really a three step process. The first is to wake up, right, Chip. So we're yeah. gonna. Can I get your agreement on this? You're gonna wake absolutely. up. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's interesting because you just agreed to that. And I'm a, yeah. I was a lawyer for 18 years, so <laughs> I got you on record. Now you agree? Right, there you go. Up. That's good. <laughs> But we all know that none of us, none of us really have a contract for that. So it's it's right. really God's grace or whatever, however yep. it is that you, you absolutely, know, you know, where where you give your thanks uh, to that which we can't understand. I mean, that we wake up in the morning is a miracle on on some yeah. level because there are people yeah. at that same moment that you're waking up, they're not waking up. They didn't wake up. That's right. That's right. You're taking that first breath. There, somebody's taking their last. Right. So, so step one is certainly that waking piece. And step two is something we talked about earlier, which is the importance of gratitude. Yeah. You know, right. to, to just for a moment, even feel what it is that, that there, that is there in the moment to be grateful for is so much, including just the breath that you've taken. And, and then those four simple words and, and my four simple words, not easy all the time, not easy when things aren't going exactly how you want them. Um, but they're profound, I think. And that's, I love my life. I, I love my life. And um, yeah. it's funny, I got just a, an advanced copy. So we've got a book that's coming out in January. Uh, oh, cool. Called the I Love My Life Challenge. Yeah. So it's a 28 day workbook. And there's a companion book that comes out some months later. Um, but this idea of I love my life and, and how do you love your life even when there are things about your life that you don't love i mean right you, sure, uh, sure. Ir ironic so uh chip are there are there words that you say at the beginning of the day or near the beginning of the day yeah uh, my daddy always told me uh don't forget who you are and what it means now just a little backstory is uh he was a um somebody who really took great pride in the family honor family tradition what the family values were a super big deal. So when he would say, usually when I was going out the door or going out with the guys or going out on a date or whatever, he would say, don't forget who you are and what that means. And so he was reminding me of those core values that made you, you, that made the Bell family who they were. And so I still, you know, every time I leave, don't forget who you are and what that means. And um, I, I, you know, pass that on to my own son, who's now got his own family. And um, from time to time, he and I have talked about that and, and revisited some of those values like, you know, honor, integrity, and, and a sense of fairness and those kind of things that were very, very important. Um, a sense of kindness, mm. that those were all a part of who we were as a family growing up. So I think grounding is really what I'm talking about. Yes. The more we find grounding um, is, 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 to me, is as important as that allegiance to a higher power. That's what I find is, is, the, is the reason I started to say those words was yeah. I, used to, I used to put my feet on the floor in the morning, like we'd expect, because um, <laughs> I don't levitate. But um, when I was doing work that didn't, that didn't really suit me, I, mean, I did I did this legal work for 18 years and and much of that time I would put my feet on the floor and, and I'd feel this anxiousness yeah yeah sometimes even yeah. anger or dread at, right, the, at right. the beginning of the day that's not a grounded to use your words no. that's not you're not grounded when that's the feeling and so I wanted to feel something entirely different about my life right. yeah and I started put my feet on the floor and I started to say I love my life even right. when it was you know, I was in the midst of change and, you know, love, you know, change can be messy. It oh, is, sure. is messy. It should be. Yeah, <laughs> it should be. Right. Yeah. So uh, I so appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. For oh, absolutely. I've been, it's been a joy to be with you, Adam. I've, I've been, uh, this is great. Everybody, you will find out more when you consult the, uh, the show notes, you'll find out more about, uh, Chip Bell, his work, his books, his the opportunity to book him as a, a keynote for your event, all those things are right there. And uh, we hope you do that. And we'd love to get your comments as well. You can go to adammarkell.com forward slash podcast, leave a comment, subscribe, tell a friend. If you know somebody that would really benefit from listening to this conversation, please 
feel free to share and we'll see you soon.